If you read the New York Times uh, on about Tuesday morning of this week, uh, you would have seen a, an article by the inventor, but Mr. Minister Fuller, and he pointed out an amazing fact that uh, in the midst of all our lack of energy resources at this moment, if you take into consideration the solar energy that we are able to capture, not the solar energy that uh, is found in the seas, but the solar energy that is found just on the earth here and on the land, the dry land on the earth, if you take into consideration that solar energy that we are able to capture and use in the year 2000 AD, allowing for the explosion of population that will have taken place by then, there is seven million times the amount of energy that we need to use each day available. Really? there is seven million times more solar energy than we will need to use as a, a tremendously expanded pop people on the earth in the year 2000. It just brings home to you, really, that oh, there is plenty of everything, you know, in our world. If we would only use the stuff the right way, but of course, as with all other gifts that have been given to us by whoever made this whole place, we really have used it in the wrong way. For instance, the worst way to use solar energy is to use the fossil fuels first that it produces. And of course, that's what we have spent our time doing, draining the earth of any coal resources that it had or any oil resources. But it is interesting, brothers and sisters, to see that our Creator is really an extravagantly kind Father to us. And that there is plenty of energy and plenty of any, everything in our world if we would only use it as he guides us. And of course, what we have shared often here in the theatre is that he has provided for the internal world of our old, own personalities just as fully and generously. And that when you and I run out of patience, and when we run out of hope or courage or the mind is no longer able to concentrate or we run out of comfort and strength that the Father is able to give us those things through the power of his uncreated life. And it is possible, therefore, to live lives of real peace and real ease. And it is God's will that we should do that. It isn't God's will that we should live in strain and that we should live not having enough hope or not having enough confidence or being pursued by inferiority complexes. It is the Father's will that we should live in absolute, complete joy and peace. It was interesting. Uh, I went to Belfast. To, to my home to visit my brother, who is a policeman. And we, as a matter of fact, we walked down uh, uh, roads that we used to play cowboys and Indians on, you know, as, as children. And uh, uh, he uh, had civvies. And I wondered why he was walking like this down the street. And then he took the coat off, you know, and had the browning 9mm underneath and a shoulder holster. So it was kind of uh, scary at, at times. But one of the things that we did was, as we all do when we go back to the family home, you know, look at old photographs. And so we looked at old photographs. And uh, he, uh, he had seen my mum when she died, and I had not. And uh, he said, you know, she was exactly like this photograph. And uh, he pointed to a picture of my mum when she was 30. And I remember her, you know, before God dealt with her over the disease and the sickness, the old strain in the face, you know, and the wrinkles and the worry. And it is interesting that when all the strain goes out of your body, you're young again. You know. And 
loved one. That's the Father's will for us. The Father's will is for us to live in continual peace, continuously free from strain. It is not the Father's will that we get the old wrinkles, or we get the old frowns, or we get the old strained look in our eyes. It is the Father's will that we live in continual trust that he is going to provide not only all the solar energy we need, but he is going to provide all the internal strength we need for our minds and our emotions and our spirits. And really it is his will that we should live that way. Of course, many of us don't. You know that. Many of us listen to what I've shared so far this morning and we say, yeah, yeah, we believe it must be like that. If he has had enough wisdom to take care of the furthest galaxy, he undoubtedly has made provision for what I need today. And we believe it in our heads. But we don't really live that way in our hearts. We don't really live in easy trust that God will give us whatever we need each moment. Now, part of the problem is that we kind of bluff ourselves that we do. We kind of get together in a theater like this and we say, yeah, that's it, we agree with you, we believe those things, we believe that he's the God of the whole universe, we believe that he loves us, we believe that he'll give us whatever we need, and we kind of cycle ourselves into it mentally, and it lasts for probably an hour today, and then Monday morning hits, and it's not so easy to live in that. Now, dear ones, God is anxious for us to know whether we are really trusting him or not. And that's really why he gave us the law. He gave us the law so that as we react to the law, we would be able to see, have we really the right relationship of ease and trust in our creator that we are meant to have? And so that's the whole purpose of the law. It's not to beat us over the head. It's not so that we'll try to obey it so as to please God. It's in order to show us, look, if you were living in easy, peaceful trust in me, then this is the kind of life you'd live. You wouldn't steal, you wouldn't commit adultery, you wouldn't bear false witness against your neighbor. And so the law is given to us to expose to us any way in which we don't trust the Father. Many of us need it because our distrust is not too obvious. I think many of us say, oh yeah, we trust God. We trust Him. And it's only the law that kind of proves whether we trust Him or not. An instance of it would be this. Uh, you've heard about my miserable little dog that size, you know. So, I can put him on the chair. I was going to bring him this morning, but I didn't know that I could trust him. So, I can, I can put him on the chair. His name is Shoe, C-H-O-U-X, French cabbage. My wife chose it, blame her. So, Shoe. And I can say, Shoe, will you jump? And, you know, he's quite happy that he trusts me completely until that moment when I say jump. And he has to jump into my arms. And then he really has to check whether he trusts me or not. And that's, one of the effects of the law. When God says to you, don't covet, don't keep walking by Dayton's window and coveting that fur coat, or don't keep walking past the car showroom and coveting that 74, then it really asks you to check out, well, do I trust him to give me whatever I need without coveting? That's one way in which the law checks out your trust. I think there's another way. Uh, spent uh, one afternoon playing with shoes at home. Great, just up and down the room, you know, chasing each other. He enjoyed it tremendously. And in every way, in every way, he seemed to uh, be completely submissive to my will and to obey me completely and utterly. While he was doing really what he wanted to do. And then I said to him, shoot, sit. And the moment I exercised a command over, to, over him, I found out how submissive he was to me. 
And it's a wee bit that way with the Father. We can say, Lord, we trust you implicitly. We have a heart of absolute trust. And there is no rebellion in us at all until God whips some command on us. And then that command exposes either the distrust in us or it exposes the rebellion against his will in us. So we bit like it with, uh, oh, with worry, you know. You, you say to yourself, oh, I trust that God is working all things in my life according to the counsel of his will. Yes, I, I trust that. You say that that's true? Yes, well, I experience it. That's the way I live. I trust that God is in complete control of my life. And then the job falls through. And God's law comes to your heart. Do not be anxious about anything. And then you find within you a panic-stricken kind of reflex reaction that you cannot control. And before you know it, you're wondering, what will I do about the job? Where will I get a job? With the state of the economy as it is, how? and the old law of God is coming in and says, do not be anxious, do not be anxious. And it kind of exposes to us that we trust God until something happens that we didn't expect. And then we see that we only trusted him while things appeared to be going the way we wanted. Or, you know, we're trusting him and we're free from worry. And we say, yeah, we are not anxious for anything. By prayer and supplication, we let our request be made known unto God. And then suddenly, a situation crops up at home where the whole home seems to be falling apart. Or where our exams don't turn out the way we wanted them to. And then the law of God comes in and says, trust God because he works all things according to the counsel of his will. And we say, yeah, well, I, I really do trust him. I do trust him. But we find within us that there is something inside that says, yeah, I trust him, but is he going to work it out the way I want him to? And we begin to find that it's a bit like the little dog. It's not simply that we don't trust him, but along with the wee bit of distrust, there is what the Bible talks about in this verse that we're studying today, there is a passion of sin. Pathemata is the Greek, and it's translated sinful passions in our RSV, but it's actually the passions of our sins are aroused by the law. And we begin to find that it's not simply that we don't trust him, but there's a passion that goes along with that that says, well, we trust him, but is he going to work it out the way we want? And there seems to be a desire inside us that is strongly opposed to the possibility that God may work things in a way that is different to our wishes. And so, loved ones, the law exposes to us not only our distrust, but exposes to us also a more sinister kind of thing that is actually just strong self-will. I think you can see it again if you look at uh, one of the laws that God has given in oh, Exodus 20 and verse 15. It's one really that you, you know well with, without looking up. But Exodus 20 and 15, it's page 63. Ones. Exodus 20 and 15. You shall not steal. And we see ourselves that obviously if we're trusting him for everything that we need, who needs to steal? If a father is our dear father and he won't leave us without anything, well, we don't need to steal anyway. And so we say, yeah, yeah, I trust the father. And then the law begins to bear in upon you about fiddling the income tax return. And the Holy Spirit begins to apply the law to you in terms of stealing God's tithe from him. Because you don't give a tithe to him of your money. And the law begins to bear in upon you about stealing God's fellowship time from him. 
because you don't pray to him each day. And the law begins to bear in upon you about stealing people's reputation from them through criticizing them. And you know what happens. The law seems to lay bare a passion that you never knew was there. There seems to rise up within you a great self-justifying, rationalizing attitude that says, oh, this is ridiculous. You don't apply the law in that kind of particular way. Stealing is just going in and stealing something that doesn't belong to you. And you begin to be aware that there is, with your distrust of God, there is a passion that rises up against God and says, you have no right to require these things from me. Now, loved ones, that's what the Bible means when it says in that verse that we're studying today that the passions of our sins are aroused by God's law. Maybe you'd look at it. It's Romans 7 and verse 5. And you remember we're talking about the value of the law to us today. Romans 7 and verse 5. While we were living in the flesh, and living in the flesh is just living as if there's no God, thinking that you're responsible for everything yourself, our sinful passions, and actually uh, the, the Greek scholars will recognize that it's pathemata ton hamarton, and it means the passions of our sins aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. And that's really what happens to us. You think you're trusting God until his law comes in upon you in some way that crosses your own will. And then you really begin to realize for the first time, maybe I don't trust him completely. And maybe that's where some of the strain comes in my life. And then something deeper happens. Because you begin to find that there's something in you that rises up and says, oh, but I do trust them, just not in these particulars. And you begin to realize that there is with that distrust a real desire to have things go your way. And it's not something that you don't trust God, but you don't trust him because you trust yourself too much. You don't trust him because you want to be sure that things will go the way you want. And you begin to find that there is within you not a great distrust alone. But there is a great resistance to God's will for your life. Dear ones, that's why the law is a dear friend. Because we need to see those things. Because it's those unconscious distrusts in you. It's those unconscious little rebellious attitudes in me that are causing the strain in our lives. And believe me, there are a thousand little ways in which you're not trusting the Father completely with your life. And it's the good purpose of God's law to expose those little places to you so that more and more you'll come free of distrust. More and more you'll come free of resistance to his will for your life. And you'll begin to come into a place of absolute peace and absolute trust. Where there's a real freedom from strain in your life. And brothers and sisters, it is possible. It really is. It's possible to live free from the worry and the gnawing anxiety. It's possible to live free from the resentment and the grudges and the critical spirit. It's possible to live free, brothers, from the driving ambition that knocks up our stomach with worry and anxiety about the future. It's possible to live in absolute trust, sisters, about the future and about who we'll be with and about how we'll spend our last days. It's possible to live in absolute peace and trust. And the real purpose of the law, for those of us who want really to trust the Creator as our Father, is to expose those little moments of distrust and those little moments of rebellion and reaction against God to us. 
it is really possible to come into that. So, when God zeroes in on you with one of his commandments, and you find that it's becoming a little heavy to bear, and it's not quite so easy not to commit adultery, or it's not quite so easy to look onto a woman without lusting her after her in your heart, or it's not quite so easy to avoid bearing false witness against your neighbor by gossip and criticism. Then look in there and ask the Holy Spirit, where am I not trusting my Father? Because you can be sure of this, that if you're trusting your Creator as your loving Father with all your heart, you'll have no trouble with the commandments. The commandments are only troublesome to us when we're not trusting him completely. So you know the little dog. I call to him and he does jump into my arms because he's done it again and again and I've never let him fall. So he knows. So the command is easy to obey. And so it is with us. So loved ones, I really just came home to me again, you know, while I was away these two weeks. It is really just true that in every situation however difficult the obstacles may be, it is possible to live in absolute trust and free from strain. Because we have a dear Father who loves you with all his heart. You know? And there isn't courage that you need that he will not give you. There isn't patience that you need that he will not give you freely through his Holy Spirit. So loved ones, would you just welcome those times when God's law seems to cross you. All he's doing is showing you how, how to enter into greater trust. It's really good. Let's all, you know, remain about 30 or 20 all our lives, you know. We're done with the old strain and the wrinkles and just peace. And that's what the world wants to see, isn't it? Let us pray. Dear Father, we thank you that you have made us a family. So we thank you that it's just good to be back with each other. But we thank you, Father, too, that we do not depend on the family for our peace. We thank you, our Father, that it is you, our dear God, who makes the sun rise every morning, who turns the earth round in regular orbits, who has filled the whole place with more energy than we can ever use. Dear Lord, we thank you that you also are our dear Father, who knows each one of us in this theater by name, and wants us to stop worrying about whether we're going to fall off the world or not. Wants us to stop worrying about things that we cannot change. And who wants us to start trusting you so that you can begin to give us all the things we need through your Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you that you're such a God and such a dear Father to us.